Hi, I'm Angela Fair. I'm here to help you become your own favorite watercolor artist. Today we're going to tackle a subject that often has artists struggling. You can paint mist or fog without using masking fluid or white paint. Watercolor's luminous qualities make it the perfect medium to paint subtle transitions of color in mist and fog. And I'm going to show you how to do it today. Let's get started. My photo of fog isn't the greatest, but I think uh, we can use it to create uh, actually a better, a better painting and paint fog without needing to use white or masking fluid. First of all, what you want to think about is that you don't have to paint the things that are behind the fog. So what we have instead of a blue sky with white clouds in front of it is we have a blue that transitions to a lighter value near to white and then gradually that white <laughs> um, which is the white of the paper or in watercolor we should always try to create our lightest values using the white of the paper and letting it shine through and then a very uh, kind of diluted version of the landscape starts to be revealed. And so rather than painting the cloud, we're actually just always painting what the cloud reveals. And in this case, we have uh, some hills coming out from under the clouds. So we might see the shadows of the landscape here quite crisply. And I'm just using a variety of blues and violets at this stage. And so there, we, at the very bottom where the fog disappears, we have these strong shapes of the landscape. And then as we get closer to the fog, those crisp shapes diffuse. And I'm just using a damp brush to soften and bleed into our fog bank. And that's really all there is to it. Um, the colors I've, because I've been working with wet pa uh, paint on dry paper, I've been able to create those crisp marks of the hill. And I'm gonna keep adding just a little bit of water and softening so that we have even more fog showing over our landscape. And, and then I think we'll pull some more landscape shapes out down below. What, what happens in painting, and this is a, a rule for really most, uh, any painting where you're observing a reference photo, is that we tend to think of it in terms of objects. So now I'm painting the hill, but I should be thinking instead of the values and the colors that I see and the shape that I see. So here I have this strong, crisp lines of the hillside. But up here, where the, where the fog is, I have this lovely soft mass of color and I can cr the, paint the shadows that I see in there, which are really nice. If I feel like at this stage, some of my color is bleeding up too much, uh, two things that I like to do, I like to tilt my painting surface. I'm just gonna stick a piece of masking tape under it to tilt it so that gravity helps the color to flow downward. And then I can also use a paper towel to blot and lift. And the paper towel will lift moisture as well, which will slow the, the it will speed the drying process and slow the process where the color might continue to bleed up. A little bit of texture created by the paper towel, which I don't love. So I'm gonna add a tiny bit of water. And this is where you run the risk of creating blooms because that fresh moisture will push against the older pigment that started to settle into the paper. So I'm gonna blot again. and. Um, let's see here. So that's our land. We also have just a very soft line down at the bottom, almost where the, I think it's actually a little bit of mist coming up from the river along this edge. So we'll see if we can work that in here. We're at the stage where things are starting to dry and it becomes a bit of a challenge now to create soft blends as this area begins to dry. Working on good paper gives you a little bit more drying time, a little more leeway to work with. I'm working with my brush to just coax some of that color to unite with the color below. 
and then I'm going to add water and soften again creating a soft edge by allowing the color to bleed. Anytime you're working with a soft edge like this, take that color right as far as you can possibly take it. Uh, I like to go right to the edge of the page with that bleed because as this color gently and gradually migrates, uh, it will stop where the water stops and you'll get a line. And if you're and our eyes are really capable of seeing very subtle transitions in value. So that line might not look like much while the paper's wet, but once it's dry, you will see that hard edge. Uh, I'm going to paint a little bit of the foreground. There's a row of land with some weeds here, and actually it's way up higher than that, more in this area. And by placing just a, a marker of where those weeds are going to go, um, I created, I have now a soft placeholder for that color. And unfortunately, I should have left a little more space because there's a snowbank as well. This whole landscape is built in layers. So again, moistening, using paper towel to lift, that kind of works. And then I'm going to place my snowbank right now using this Cenarius Blue. It's a gorgeous color, slightly opaque, and the links to all the colors I'm using today are in the, the description below the video. And we're going to go a little more ultramarine with that. I think it'll match my reference photo just a little bit better. if I adjust the color there. So our fog doesn't look complete. We're gonna come back to this after it's dried and touch it up. Remember though, as you're painting the fog, we plan that from the very beginning. Fog, mist, anything where the painting is diffused, you wanna do that in the early first layer so that you can create a lot of softness and a lot of transparency. Paint those light values that you see and fill the paper because you can build up the darks in the successive layers. Next steps after the break. We're going to continue to develop this painting in just a moment. And in fact, I'm actually going to turn it into a mountain scene instead of just the subtle hills that we had started with. So hold on for that. But before we do that, I want to tell you about my beginner boot camp. This is a watercolor course. It's a three day event just for really anyone who wants to strengthen their techniques in watercolor. It's taking place February 27th, 28th and March 1st, 2019. You can sign up for that using the link in the description below the video or on my website at angelafair.com. Also in the description, I have links to supplies that will help you. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm sharing new lessons every week to help you become a strong and independent watercolor artist. Leave a comment below and let me know what subjects you're struggling with in your painting journey right now. Maybe I'll be able to feature them in a future video. Let's continue. Something to remember when you're painting Mr. Fog is that not only does the color get paler as you go into the mist, but the color also decreases in saturation. So that means your color is going to get grayer and less vibrant. Often that happens just by making the color paler, by lightening it, paling it, I was going to say that so wrong. But sometimes you might find that you need to also tone down a color in intensity. Uh, that might mean uh, just getting it a little bit closer to gray, which usually means mixing a little bit of its complement into that diluted wash as you as you build up those those paler depths. Now, technically, my reference photo actually is more of a cloud than a mist, and so that means I have to make some decisions about um, how to make how how much to make visible, uh, how to how to make my cloud have some presence. But I'm also thinking about you. And uh, if you're painting mist, what we're often going to see is a very shadowed shape behind uh, through that mist. So I'm going to do that instead of what my reference photo is telling me. And you can th all thank me if this all turns out. So here we have um, these soft violets, violet blue, and we're going to tone it down a little bit and work with a bit of a muted grayed color. 
So I'm just adding it. I just added a teeny hint of this opaque yellow to my to my blue. And uh, I think my color is going to be too dark. We're going to make a really faint. We're going to turn this into a really faint mountain and building up those depths. There's always more than one way to do something. I could have done some of this in the first layer of the painting, um, but I'm choosing to do it now. We're going to dilute, paint that mountain shape, add a little hint of the violet to it as we get down closer to the lower part where the mist fades away. And so we're actually creating that feeling of mist by not just softening edges, but also by diluting color and decreasing saturation. So I'm making a point to my mountain over here. And then I'm going to soften. And I'm going to start um, just by adding some water to bleed some of that color out. So I want a variation. I want a path of mist right through the middle here. Lose all those edges. And don't worry too much at this stage about softening too much. You can always add more hard edges, but it's really, really hard to take a hard edge away. So we want to err on the side of caution when it comes to how we place our edges. Let's place another mountain here. And because I have this moist path right now, I'm actually going to get um, that soft path that we talked about as I paint. So again, more than one way to do things. And again, path of moistening, softening edges, creating that path. Now it's very, very soft at this stage, very gentle, and that is okay, but it's a little, it's also a little bit timid. It doesn't really give that strong sense of mist. So I wanna amp it up a bit. So we're gonna darken some of our values. I've kind of used a little smorgasbord of color here. I'm not quite sure which what does what? And we're going to strength, strengthen and darken our lower part of our mountains so that the upper part will seem softer. I'm pulling up a little bit into here to give us soft mist and then again darkening here. And because we wanted this to feel a little bit like a mist rising up from the ground, we're going to try to soften down there too. But look at how that made that cloud just have a little more presence just hint at some more landscape in there. And I'm working on a fairly small piece of paper. It might actually work better to go a little bit bigger so that you can plan to make your cloud a little larger. And everything's still quite moist in my painting, which really gives me that ability to play again with the soft edges for a little bit longer. And I just messed up my mountain's peak quite a bit, so we adjust again. Actually, I'm going to soften in there. I want softness. And softness in here. And by actually, by placing some mountain kind of rock lines, and then softening, we create um, that transparent feel where you can see 
the landscape emerging through the clouds. So it's not, it's not in vain. It's not leaving those areas blank because we need that little hint of stuff showing through to give that sense of distance. Okay, so we're just going to paint our weedy bits here. Going back to that nice, I think this is Mars yellow. And we're just going to throw some grasses up in here. A little band of yellow. A space for my top of my snowbank. And this is a little bit of improvisational. You do not have to paint it exactly the way you see it. You want to create a mood or an impression. And I'm going to throw a brown in. Hematite Burnt Scarlet to be my kind of shadows in the weeds here. And we're going to spend a little more time pushing our contrasts in our mountains still. And the reason we want to do that is right now, if you look at this painting, the first thing you see, your eye goes right to the bottom of the scene. If we were to cover that, your just changes the way you experience the painting. So by adding some darkest darks up in the mountain here, direct the eye to the focal point, to where we want the viewer to look. Um, I'm painting the mount my mountains without the benefit of a reference photo because I have painted mountains many, many times before. If you haven't painted a lot of mountains, you'll do better having a reference photo to refer to. That's why we call it a reference photo. I'm going to try to simplify down below here with... I still want the strong contrast, but I want to do it with larger shapes than I would along the peak of my mountain. Because of the dampness of the paper, I'm having, there's a lot of softness that starts to happen as we move down. And that's stuff I want to see as well. It helps create that misty feel. And I can't really leave well enough alone. I'm looking at this shadow down at the bottom and I, I see it uh, in my reference photo as stronger and bolder. It might completely derail the entire painting. And that's what cropping is for, <laughs> putting the brushes down. Let's uh, spend a moment analyzing the painting and talking about what works and what doesn't. So I've said this before, but if you are painting the mist or the fog, something obscuring something else, you don't have to paint the things that are being obscured. You get to see it as it looks in your reference photo. That means that we have a, we have a mountain, but we have a mountain that disappears halfway through. We And we get to paint it that way by focusing our painting on painting only what we can see in our reference photo we are better able to create that feeling of mist. And I'm just lifting because <laughs> I want to spread my mist out even more. And uh, if you're using non-staining colors, you know, you can tweak with that a little bit. If you're using good quality paper, you can re-wet and lift some of that color even after it started to dry and settle into the painting. I'm just going to rub it a little bit, see if I can lift that mark. That one doesn't want to lift. But that's adding to my misty feel as well. If I were to decide that I had something showing in my scene and that I wanted to cover, that I wanted to create as a mist, and I were to choose to use white paint, uh, gouache or white acrylic, to try to create that feeling, 
generally what happens when you start to place white gouache on your painting is it really stands out like a sore thumb. It doesn't have the same luminous qualities that painting with transparent watercolor and letting the white of the paper show through creates. As soon as we add white, it's introducing something separate from what's happening here. Right now, all of my whites are created by the white of the paper shining through. So if I were to start placing white paint on my paper, it's not gonna unify and combine. It's gonna stand out. So that's one reason I want to plan ahead with my painting and allow my light values and my whites to come from the light of the paper. That's the wonderful, luminous, beautiful quality of transparent watercolor. If I were to decide that I want to use masking fluid to leave to save my whites so that I could paint the mist in my painting, I would have a, yet another issue because as I put the masking fluid onto this area, it would leave a hard edge and that hard edge would rob my painting of that softness that I really need to create that feeling of mist. So planning ahead, painting with uh, wet and wet techniques, lifting out to allow some of that color to show through. All of those things just work so much better than using masking fluid or white paint to create your fog. I hope you'll give it a try. Now I'd love to see what you create at home. You can feel free to share that with me on my Facebook page, Angela Fair Watercolor Workshop, or visit me at angelafair.com and let me know how it went for you, or leave a comment at the bottom of the video. And I'm just gonna keep fussing here until I run out of paint or it's time to make supper. Whatever comes soonest, I encourage you to head off and do your own painting and have a great day.